I'm in chapter 10 in the book of Hebrews. I'm going to start in verse 1 just to get to the conundrum. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with the sacrifices which they offer year by year continually make the, the comers there and too perfect. In other words, when God gave instruction through Moses and Aaron for the children of Israel to build, let them make me a sanctuary that I may what? Dwell, that I may dwell among them, that I may come into their presence. But God had to hide behind a tent, behind a tent, behind a tent, under a tent. He had to cover himself because if his glory were to break forth in that sanctuary, the camp would be obliterated. So God had to hide himself. And the law which God gave in this context, the Ten Commandments, is a shadow of good things to come. That's what it says. And not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers there into perfect. In other words, I've prayed more than a few prayers in my life. I'm sure you have probably several times a day. But when you get up tomorrow morning, the problems are still there. The need is still there. Verse 2. There were comers and they brought their offerings and they brought their prayers. Verse 2. For then would they not have ceased to be offered because the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sin. In other words, I come to God and I say, please forgive me my sins. Okay. The promise of Scripture is if we confess our faithful and just, He's faithful and just, if we confess our sins, to forgive us our sins. Let's go on verses 2 to 3. Look at verse 3. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. It's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Uh-oh, here we are. This is what I want you and everybody in the camp to do. Bring offerings. Bring sacrifices. Bring yourselves stand outside the tent let the priests go in and you're going to bring a sacrifice for sin but does that get rid of the sin yes or no how long has that been going on well at least 2,000 years 3,000 years since they had the sacri the uh, sanctuary out in the wilderness in the desert Verse 3, in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. It's not possible that the blood of bulls, here's your conundrum. It is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. If you keep reading it, it talks about rivers of blood. It talks about all the sacrifices that have been made through all the years and all the lives and all the whatever. Verse 4, it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. That's your conundrum here. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you would not, but a body you have prepared for me. So how can we do, the, do this and make some sense out of it? Let's see if I can find my chalk over here. It is apparent that God is working through this problem of sin. I don't want to say piecemeal, but He's staging So in the sanctuary, the first stage in, in an attempt on God's part, not an attempt, but in God's work of taking care of the sin problem, getting, getting rid of your sin and mine we have to get, God has to get us to the place where He can wipe out even the memory. That's what the problem is here. Every time you take something to me or to prayer and say, God, forgive me, you're just being reminded and reminded and reminded and reminded and reminded. And we have to remind God so He won't forget about us and won't 
you know, turn his back on us. So Jesus had to come according to the sanctuary and be a lamb. Now, how was this conundrum worked out? There's uh, Abraham and Isaac up on top of the mountain. And uh, we're bringing the wood, we're bringing the fire, we're bringing the knife, we're bringing everything, but we don't have a sacrifice. And so Isaac says to Daddy, uh, here's the wood, and here's the fire, and here's the stone for the altar, and here, and here, and here, but where's the sacrifice? That was a conundrum. It still is. How can God offer His Son, literally offer His Son, and His Son offer His blood to take care of your sin and mine? So Jesus fulfilled the first part of this mission to come and save human beings. He became the Lamb. In, in uh, Revelation, the judgment opens in chapter 4 of Revelation. By the time you get through chapter 4 and chapter 5, one likened to the Son of Man comes into the, into the sanctuary and He is the Lamb of God. So Jesus met this need. And what was the need? The blood of bulls and goats and lambs and whatever cannot take care of the problem. So it takes real blood and it has to be clean blood. So who is God going to send that's clean? If He didn't have His Son to send, who would be our Savior? Who would be our Messiah? Who, who would intervene in behalf of the whole human race? So I want to just plant the seed and have you consider Jesus comes and very few people, very few human beings on this rock understand that He's coming as a child. He's coming as a human being. So we've got a couple of three shepherds out in the field. We have some angels up in the sky singing. We have some foreigners coming from very few people understand the greatest event that ever marked humanity in these six, seven thousand years, the greatest event that has occurred, almost nobody knows about it, knew about it or knows about it. Very few people understand that what Jesus did here is part of the solution, but is not the solution. That's the, that's the conundrum part of this. You, you do what you can, as long as you can, but it's never enough. Never. So Jesus came, and one of the first miracles He performed was uh, the miracle of the wine at the marriage, and the next was bread. Now, if you've got several thousand people spread out on the hill in front of you and you want to get their attention, you, you really want them to focus on what you're saying and what you represent, how do you get the attention of people? Free bread. Are you listening? If you turn the news on today and tonight and tomorrow, Free bread. That's what we want. We want free bread. We want a paycheck without working for it. We want free medical treatment. We want. We demand. 
So Jesus, talking about this experience, said, uh, you need something beyond what you're, 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 you're coming because of the bread. You're following me from place to place because of the bread. There are lessons. So Jesus is the bread in the second apartment. This is the court. This is the first apartment. How long is this? From um, Moses and the children of Israel and the sanctuary till we get to Jesus showing up? 1,000, 1,500 years, whatever. So where is the bread in the sanctuary? Where is the bread in the sanctuary? It's in the first apartment. The first apartment is called the uh, holy place. All right? And where is the bread positioned or stationed in the holy place? North yes, on the sides of the north. It's an amazing study if you really go digging. So, God has made provision through Christ, and when people did not understand who Messiah was when he was here, um, he said, God has provided for you no, no, Moses did all of that. Moses gave us the bread. Jesus said, no, Moses didn't give you the bread. I'm the bread that came down from heaven. So, Jesus is moving through the sanctuary. He succeeded as the lamb. He was slain. Now he's the bread. Let's go back 30 years in my life, 35 years. I had a conversation with the Lord, and I really shouldn't put it that way. I shouldn't say it that way. God had a conversation with me. It was a very difficult time in my ministry. And God began to make known to me what His will was for today and tomorrow and so forth. And that's when He began to say to me in plain certain terms, this is what I want you to do. I want you to start an independent ministry. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. What does the word independent mean? Trouble. I want you to start an independent ministry. And what am I supposed to do? You're supposed to do these three things. You're supposed to print books. Never printed books in my life. Don't know a thing about it. Don't know how. It sounds expensive to me. I, I don't think I want to do that, Lord. I want you to go among the lay people, lay members of the church, and I want you to put them to work. Oh, my. That sounds good. It sounds fun. It sounds lovely. It is trouble with a capital T. The leadership of the church in no uncertain terms said to me, you're trying to steal our members. You're trying to take what God has given us in the church, talking about the denomination, and you're leading people astray. So I kind of had a taste of this and seen this in action, and I said to the Lord, I, I, I really don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I see trouble. I smell trouble. I taste trouble. I don't want to do that. I've told this story many times, but it, it, it was very real. And uh, I had a two-way conversation with the Lord. He spoke. I answered. He spoke. I answered. And after I got about three times saying no, he worked a miracle and said, this is what I want you to do. And I agreed, finally agreed. And I'm not trying to put God in a false light here. Uh, I'm not the only person down through the centuries that God wanted to use and did call and 
They said, uh, thanks, but no thanks. You understand? Finally, when I was about to say no the third time, <clears throat> God sent an answer so plain, so clear, that you could not be mistaken about it. And you better answer positively. Don't keep saying no, because you can drive away the Spirit of God. And that was not my purpose or intent. But neither was it my purpose or intent to start a publishing work and do all of these other things that were listed. And uh, finally, I said to the Lord, I don't know how to print books. It sounds like a lot of money and I don't want to ask people for money. That's more trouble. And God's word to me was, I will provide. I will make the way you take up the task, take up the work, go do it. So the very first gift that was given um, was handed to me within 36 hours of me having a conversation with God saying, uh, this sounds very expensive and I don't know how to pay for it. I promised to pay for it, God said, and here is a check from one of my people, one of my children. Here's a check for $5,000. Go to work. The second check was given by a Roman Catholic Christian in another place. I happened to be visiting with friends in that home there were about 20 or 30 people in the, in the home visiting that afternoon. Somebody said, well, Brother Wheeling is here. Brother Wheeling, tell us what the Lord wants you to do. We've heard things. And uh, just in a simple testimony, I said, well, this is what the Lord said. And He seems to be good to His Word. He is making a way. And the answer came in a check from a Roman Catholic Christian. He was upstairs and wouldn't come down because all these Adventists were in his house and he didn't like the Adventists. Thank you. Thank you, I apologize, but it's a Parkinson's syndrome. Anyhow, this man was upstairs in this, in this home I didn't know he was up there, and I didn't know he was listening. The house was full of Adventists, except for one person, and that was the husband and head of the house. And after visiting another half hour or so with these folk, and we were ready to have prayer and say goodbye, and nice to meet you, and hope we see you again, and whatever. Um, this man called his wife upstairs, and handed her a check to hand to me. So she came downstairs and she said, thank you for coming to my home, our home. She said, uh, you have to forgive my husband. He doesn't like to come down when Adventists are in the house. And he told me to give you this. And she handed me a check that was folded. I didn't even know it was a check. I just thought it was a note of thanks for coming and whatever. He handed a check for $25,000. And he said the same thing the first person said, go to work. Now I believe God talks to us. I believe God talks to you and me in ways that we're probably not aware that God is talking to us, but He is. He's working things, planning things. And he has promised again and again, before they call, I will answer. I want to tell you that Jesus successfully met the role of the Lamb. And Jesus successfully met the provider. He makes a way. You need books? You need money? Here's the money. Go to work. You understand? This is... This is the conundrum right here. Jesus 
came, Jesus met, Jesus provided, Jesus is the answer, but Jesus is not back yet. We're still here. That's the conundrum. Three hours to get into trouble, thousands of years to get out. So what is God going to do to get us out of this terrible state of sin and hurt and pain that we're in? What is God promising to do? He's going to take all the problems, all of them, and throw them into the depths of the sea. Would you like for that to happen? Would you like for it to happen today and not tomorrow? Sooner than later, yes. That's what we want. So what are we waiting for? We're waiting for God to provide a way of escape. And that's what the book of Revelation is all about. In Hebrews 10, again, I want to read just two or three verses. When he came, cometh, verse 5, into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you would not, but a body has, hast thou provided for me. So this takes us to the mountain with Abraham and Isaac. Where's the sacrifice? And God instructed Abraham to put Isaac on the altar and lift a knife over him and sacrifice him. Is that what God wants? Is that really what God wants? How many millions of people have come and gone on this planet and offered their children? Down here in South America, they're digging up every day hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of mummified children who were offered to God. Can you imagine? I can't. I want to... Uh, I want you to go to Matthew chapter 12 with me. Verse 28. Matthew 12, and we'll pick this up in verse 28. This is red letter. This is Jesus talking. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, verse 28, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Or else how can one enter into a strong man's high house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scatters abroad. Verse 31. Don't, don't miss it. Verse 31. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. Would that include your sins and mine? What does the word all signify? All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven. What tense is shall? Future tense. Evidently, all our sins have not been blotted out. They're still in the record. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Whoa. This is part of the conundrum. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Which one of these three is God? I am God and there is none else. How can God be more than one person. Come on, this is, this is a conundrum. This is what we're looking at. We're trying to make sense out of what heaven is doing here in order to get us back. So the Father and the Son can be seen, have been seen, are seen. What does the Holy Spirit look like? Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. What is there about sinning against the Holy Spirit that cannot be forgiven? Here's the conundrum. I'm a sinner. I commit sin. I want to be forgiven my sin. But it takes the Holy Spirit 
for me to come to God and say, I want forgiveness. If you offend and sin against and blaspheme against the Holy Ghost, you have nothing to draw you toward the Father and the Son. Does that make sense? Um, there's another text in similar fashion, John chapter 7. Let's look at it for a minute. John 7, 39. Verse 39. I, I, I think I'm going to start in verse 37. Would you look at it, John 7, 37? In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. That's what we've been talking about in the land. And Verse 38, He that believeth on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Verse 39, look at this. This is a conundrum. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Are you looking? Do, do you begin to get the drift right here? Something has to happen before Jesus can fulfill His promise to give the Spirit. It's in your best interest that I go and if I go, I will send my Spirit. All right? So, it says, the Holy Ghost was not yet given. When, when was the Holy Ghost given? Acts chapter 1, 2. When was the Holy Ghost given? Oh, the Holy Ghost has been with us all down through the centuries. Not in the same capacity. Not in the same... Yeah. He had to die. And He had to come back to life. If He died and didn't come back to life, it was wasted effort. It was wasted expense. It was wasted. So only God could come and literally die and literally live again. So the Holy Spirit was not yet given. So Jesus goes to heaven and now He can send the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1 and 2. Wait for these days, wait for this time, wait for this signal from heaven, and God will pour out His promise. Wait for the promise of the Father. So, we have a high priest now, according to the book of Hebrews. This is the whole book of Hebrews. Uh, Jesus met, met, and is meeting. So what is Jesus doing right now in heaven? As a high priest, what's He doing in heaven? Waiting for His Father to say. He's waiting on His Father. Uh, he's building houses. He is sitting patiently, faithfully, obediently beside His Father waiting for His Father to say, Son, receive your reward. Receive your inheritance. Receive what is rightfully yours, which you have surrendered. So He went from the Son of God in heaven to the Son of Man down here. And you and I are waiting for God, just like Jesus is waiting for God. And what is going to happen in the book of Revelation at a certain time, which we call the time of the end, what is going to happen? What is the final work of the high priest? He's going to blot out sin. Now evidently, uh, this is a fascinating study if you get into it, and you should. There's a time in the heavenly sanctuary yet to come. It hasn't come yet, hasn't arrived yet, but we know it will come. This is the message that has to go to the whole world, Jesus said. What is that message? That the kingdom of heaven is what? At hand. The kingdom of heaven does not come for Jesus. He does not become King of kings and Lord of lords until His Father says, Son, now when He leaves the sanctuary, when He completes His work as high priest,
for humanity when he completes his work as high priest for humanity. Lamb, bread, high priest, forgiveness. What comes next? He comes out of the sanctuary, our great high priest, he comes out and he removes his high priestly robes and he puts on which robes? The robes of war. Revelation 20, 19, 20. He is no longer the bread. He is, but he's no longer the lamb. He is, but And there is a time just ahead when he will no longer be high priest. And when he comes out, what does he say? What does he declare? He that is righteous, let him be forgiven. That's the context. Whoever is forgiven. Whoever overcomes. Now tell me how you're going to overcome. In, in simple terms, how are you going to overcome? Jesus, that's how you overcome. So, what is the conundrum? The conundrum is, when Jesus leaves the sanctuary in heaven, it signals what? That God is not going to tolerate sin any longer. This generation has come and gone, and this generation has come and gone, and this generation is us. This is who we are. This is where we are. And when the time comes that Jesus stands in heaven and says, it's finished, it's done. What are you going to pay heaven to be scot-free, to be free from sin, to be forgiven? What are you going to pay? You have nothing to pay with. Yes, you do. By faith, you have something to pay with. Heavenly Father, I have nothing to offer but Jesus. Once upon a time, in one of my seminars, somehow the conversation moved to what is Jesus doing as high priest in heaven? And there are all kinds of ideas out there, all kinds of solutions out there that people offer. And uh, the temperature was rising. This one would say, well, I believe this. And this one would say, well, I believe that. And finally, there was one young man present in the meeting that day, and he stood up and he said, oh, no. All we have left is Jesus. That's all. Is that, is that enough? Things have to change up there, and things have to change down here, and I believe they're in the process of changing. I believe that there are things taking place while we're right here this morning in relative peace and calm. There are things taking place that if we really, if, if you could see and I could see with clear vision what's, what's going on behind closed doors in the highest places of government, in the highest offices of banking and highest military. Yesterday, I had a phone call and um, the person said, if you don't have this quote you need it, it's from a, a high placed person in the military. And this is just out yesterday. He said, we're about to see the bear confront the lion. And that's scary because the world doesn't know about the bear and the lion yet. They don't understand what's going on, but we are, we're getting there and we're getting there very quickly. Something else I want to mention before we close this morning, it's a conundrum. Um, the UFO experience is a centuries-old, millennia-old uh, event. 
people have been seeing things. Elijah was taken up in a chariot of fire, caught up to heaven, and all of this has been going on a long time. UFOs. Jesus warned that there would be deceptions when this time comes. Ellen White warned that there would be deceptions. And soon there will be seen these demonic appearances in the, in, uh, above the cities. And this is a signal. This is a demonic signal that the battle is about to be joined, the last battle. So these UFOs are being seen with all the modern instruments of warfare, all the modern radars, all the things that are going on. And uh, this is occupying Congress and the military every day. Every day. I want to challenge you. Take a copy. Alien Encounters. Yeah, page 45 in Perfect Storm. I saw three unclean spirits. They're the spirits of devils working miracles and going forth to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. From the X-Files to Medium, from Stephen King and J.K. Rowling to Coast to Coast AM with George Norrie and Art Bell, media moguls and marketing geniuses are cashing in on modern day spiritualism from psychics to ghosts, from out-of-body experiences to near-death experiences, countless millions are buying the Grand Eden lie. You can read the rest of it for yourself. Um, this is where we are. All of these things that we have known about to some degree, talked about for years and years, suddenly are in the news. Headline in the news. And you're probably unaware of this unless you go looking. Just go online and look up UFOs in today's news. Just, just go online. I'll put it together like this. Out in New Mexico, Arizona, I believe it's New Mexico, the federal government owns millions of acres of land that they don't allow the public to enter. You're not going to go riding your motorbike around in this forest. You're not. You're not. And uh, in recent years, not many years now, um, permission was granted by the federal government of the United States to the Vatican to go into this deep forest, <coughs> desert, remote desert location and build a telescope, a modern telescope. And uh, this was done. There's a name given to this telescope Lucifer. and what's going on. Yes. It's called Lucifer. Lucifer. And this is in the news, but you don't know it because common people, did. we don't have time to keep up with life, much less but we have all kinds of uh, indications that we're about to be, as Jesus said, when this time comes, there will be deception of all kinds from every direction. Be careful and don't be deceived. Be watchful and don't be deceived. Be prayerful and don't be deceived. This is where we are and this is where we're going very, very quickly. There's so much more that could be said and will be said before we're out of here. But there is something about this humble place, this humble ministry, this humble work that is not a humble work. It is a grand work. And it has gone far and wide to places that today we can't go, not in person because doors are closing. Pardon me, let me sit down for a minute here. Doors are closing. Um, I don't want to say 
where but doors are closing at the same time doors are opening and we need to go through them and in order to do that the God who promised I will I will take care of the cost I will meet the need but you go to work and do it so we're going to be laying plans very specific plans I've already given orders to the people here in the office who can help us shape the plans for the next months weeks maybe a year or two I'll close with this I had a conversation with someone last night and this person said to me I don't know how much time we have left but just just following the news something big is about to happen I said yeah you 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 you're wanting a time you want to put a time on it get the book of Daniel down and start reading it and read it and read it and read it and you'll find God has forewarned, foretold. God has opened doors and windows and if we don't come up to the task, He will pass us by. So the story of history and the story of this book is God raised up a people and had to pass them by and raise up a new people and pass them by and raise up a new people and pass them by. Doesn't mean these people who are being passed by are lost. Doesn't mean that. But it means they did not meet the challenge. They did not come up to the task. And so God has to go from Judaism to Christianity, from Christianity to Catholicism, from Catholicism to Protestantism, and from ism, 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 and God is going to put together a people. This is the work of the Holy Spirit, is to put together a people till we all come together in the unity of the faith. That's the promise, and we're not far from it. Father in heaven, we thank you for another day, another blessing, another promise. Help us to understand that Jesus has been faithful in meeting every need, every need, we have needs, physical, financial, spiritual. And I ask again that you meet our needs individually, in each family, each group. Please bless us. We need your blessing and we ask for it. In Jesus' name, amen.